Yes, that's great. Well, thank you very much for asking me to uh, join this uh, two-hour webinar. And it's a great honor to talk about Peter Morris. I've never actually done that. Well, actually, no, I have done it once before. It was many, many years ago. And uh, so it's been great fun going through some old pictures and putting this presentation together. This is definitely my most favorite picture of Peter. It's Peter uh, when he was the president of the College of Surgeons in London. At this stage in life, he was pretty pleased with what he had achieved, I suspect. He had a great smile on his face and he was looking pretty relaxed. Sometimes when you saw him in the transplant center, he was not quite as relaxed as that. And I had the feeling that, um, uh, that he was a happy man at that point in time. Um, I'm going to start this slide, this talk, by presenting this picture of the first successful kidney trans clinical kidney transplant surgery, which we've already seen. You can see Joseph Murray um, in the middle there, uh, placing a kidney into a recipient. And I guess if there's a take home message from my presentation tonight, it is that when it comes to kidney transplantation, the surgery is the easy part. Um, the rest is difficult. Um, the first transplant involved a couple of identical twins, uh, Richard and Ronald. Um, Richard was the recipient and Ronald was the donor. They had skin grafts beforehand and uh, fingerprinting to confirm their uh, the fact that they were identical. And it was all pretty good, um, good uh, happy ending for this particular procedure. The recipient married his nurse and the donor died 52 years later, albeit with some um, uh, uh, poor kidney function. Now, if you look at this picture, and it definitely has a place in history, on the left side there of those five people, you can see their smiles, they're happy. And as you move over to the right, to the dark side, as I put it, you can see um, the live donor and the live donor surgeon. And my understanding is the live donor surgeon had a really difficult time with the operation. Um, and this picture was taken about six weeks after the procedure. And you can see even then that the, the donor, um, the man with the triangle sign of stress, uh, as my um, psychology friends tell me, uh, is still worried about the procedure. He's probably got a large incision to the left side. So this was a great start and it made clinical transplantation possible, but it came with its problems. In 1956, um, uh, Peter Morris, um, two years after this procedure was being performed, was a medical stu uh, a student at uh, Melbourne University. And he subsequently described this as some of the best years of his life. But it was in 1956 that Morris Ewing performed the first deceased donor kidney transplant in Australia at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And always the emphasis in transplantation in Australia has been deceased donation and not living donation. In his final year, he met Joss, uh, who he uh, married three years later, and they remain married. This is the InterVarsity cricket match between uh, the Melbourne University 11 and the Adelaide University 11, and it was played in Melbourne. It was a happy day, even the umpires are smiling, and you can certainly note, you cannot see any of those um, triangles of stress in the gentleman's fingers or hands uh, in this picture. In 1961, after three years of medical officer experience uh, in Melbourne, Peter and Joss headed to London, as, as Peter put it, for cutting experience and to pass the FRCS exam, which in, the, in those days there was no Australian surgical exam. Um, the decision to go there was in part influenced by Dr. Claude Welsh, a visiting MGH surgeon from Boston, uh, who Peter was most impressed with because he was pretty slick at the operating table. But most importantly, he always said please and thank you at the operating table uh, whenever talking to his nurses or support uh, surgical team. He went to the Hammersmith Hospital uh, and described just uh, describe what he felt for the first time he was in a truly academic surgical centre. Um, Claude Welsh later went on to help Peter um, to open doors, as he put it, in the USA, initially as a surgical fellow in Boston. In 
In Boston, uh, Peter was blessed with a huge surgical workload as a resident, uh, but he went there so that he could do research. And after his first year, he had no trouble finding some research positions, uh, initially uh, in looking at the mechanisms of infection defense. He then developed, because the lab was across the corridor from him, a, uh, an interest in transplant histocompatibility with a very famous uh, US uh, transplant surgeon, Paul Russell. Towards the end of 1966, and before he really had much experience with histocompatibility, he was uh, uh, invited to return back to, to, um, to Melbourne by uh, Professor Morris Ewing, um, the man who'd done the uh, deceased kidney donor transplant 10 years earlier to set up and develop a tissue matching service at Royal Melbourne Hospital. Fortunately or unfortunately, um, they had inadequate funding after they uh, appointed Peter to Royal Melbourne Hospital. Uh, this meant that Peter had to find some other um, research activities. And, it, with, and um, he was invited to join uh, Dr. David Hume in Virginia. Uh, uh, Dr. Hume was one of the initial uh, kidney transplant team in Boston in 1954. And by this time in 1966, he had developed the largest kidney transplant center in the world and was widely considered to be a superb teacher and who also enjoyed life to its fullest. Uh, Peter Morris was invited to analyze Hume's transplant sera, which was essentially a biobank uh, kept at 120 degrees of all the pre and post transplant buds of, um, the, of Hume's entire kidney transplant experience in Virginia. With this uh, sera, he was able to demonstrate the development of cytotoxic antibodies and subsequently also described hyperacute rejection. 1968 found the funding in Melbourne and Peter returned to Royal Melbourne Hospital, where he was a senior lecturer along with some really good uh, um, uh, young surgeons in Australia, Vernon Marshall and Geoffrey Collins, who were famous for the Marshall solution uh, and the Collins solution. Um, they were impressive lecturers and tutorials and as a, a medical student, and this is where um, I spent most of my time between uh, 1968 and, sorry, 1968 and 1973. It was in the medical school at Royal Melbourne Hospital. I didn't take much notice of this, but a bit like Peter, I preferred to play cricket and football and do all sorts of other things apart from medicine during medical school. It was in uh, at the Royal Melbourne, however, where Peter uh, developed a long working relationship with Alan Ting, a uh, famous tissue typist. Peter moved to Oxford in 1974, where he was appointed at the age of 39 to the Nuffield Chair of Surgery. And with that came uh, head of the whole of the Department of Surgery. He moved with his family of five children and was soon joined by his laboratory team from Melbourne, which um, included tissue typists, uh, and clinicians. The Kidney Transplant Centre opened in 1978. You can see a picture here of Peter uh, with um, Professor Peter Medawa, a physician, um, I'll go back one slide, physician Des Oliver, um, who's a little bit disinterested in transplantation, I suspect. Um, and there's Peter. And this gentleman here is probably the closest one. He was one of the senior academics at the university uh, uh, and in the UK, and I think he had a, a small uh, triangle of stress associated with opening a new transplant centre. I joined the Oxford team in 1984, and uh, Oxford was a place that many Australians went to. And I've put some circles there. The first one um, is, uh, and if you, the important people sat in the front row, and the the, this circle here surrounds all the important ladies in, uh, or women in Peter's life at Oxford at the time. Uh, for his uh, secretary, Joan, uh, the charge sisters of the wards that he worked in, and his senior research people in Catherine uh, Wood, um, Sue Fugel, and Maggie Dolman. Maggie Dolman was famous for turning up to late for everything, so she was in the third row. 
Um, the surgeon said here, um, that's me with very, very cold hands because it was uh, very autumnal when this picture was taken. And, and there's um, Jeremy Chapman. He was really the only physician in the whole of this, um, of this department in 1985. And he didn't really have a clinical position. He was undertaking research uh, in Alan Ting's lab, which is there. And the other important person there was the finance person. Um, there are a long list of Australian trainees in Oxford. And the first was John Thompson, who returned to Sydney and became a very important liver and kidney transplanter and, uh, and now has a huge melanoma uh, organisation set up here. Um, those are the early ones. We tended to work with uh, people who also worked in Oxford. And for me, the important thing was uh, person rather was Jeremy Chapman. Um, in 1985, you can see a picture here of Peter operating. Um, if Peter were listening, I'd apologize for the black and white thing, a picture because it looks a bit like the old Boston picture. But Peter um, did all of the living related kidney transplant procedures. Um, they're invariably done on Monday mornings in a dedicated operating theater, but we also had a dedicated biochemistry laboratory. The urologist performed the nephrectomy and Peter did the recipients. The role of the surgical fellows was to um, do all the deceased donor retrievals and the recipient surgery. Peter Morris determined the immunosuppression protocols and they're all usually all uh, within Oxford clinical trials. The other important uh, event that happened for me in 1985 was to see the sixth and last pancreas transplant performed in uh, Oxford uh, using the duct uh, occlusion technique, example of which you can see here. Um, I enjoyed life in Oxford, um, particularly playing uh, in the Oxford Shidley early cricket. And this is a, 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 a picture that actually was taken uh, at Peter Morris's best shift in 2001 at Blenheim Palace. Um, I could never find Peter on uh, Saturday mornings because he was always playing golf uh, and didn't have a mobile phone. And uh, he could never find me on Saturday afternoons because I was always playing cricket. There was always a good side and a soft side to Oxford. In 1985, Peter approached me and said that um, I'd played enough cricket in Oxford and it was time for me to go find another job and that I'd better improve my um, CV and that um, there was a potential that I could be invited to start up a new transplant unit in Sydney at Westmead Hospital. With a like this at uh, John Radcliffe Hospital, um, there was no, uh, no uh, reason to want to stay in Oxford. Um, uh, and like all Australians, we uh, all tend to go back home. Um, the most important person I brought back from Oxford was not uh, a tissue typist, but he was, and I suppose in some respects, which was, it was Jeremy Chapman who had developed a uh, very important working relationship within the unit from a research perspective and from a clinical uh, perspective. The man here who looks a little bit disinterested is a pancreas transplant surgeon uh, at Westmead Hospital who had done a lot of research but all using duct occlusion models. And uh, when we started up the program in 1987, we used a, uh, a whole pancreas uh, technique. We started up a prospective uh, assessment of all the benefits of simultaneous pancreas kidney transplantation, and it's really formed the basis of, uh, of Westmead's reputation uh, in clinical transplantation. Uh, in 1990, we put up a, uh, our first graph at an international uh, meeting, and this was a 100% graph survival after 30 months for the first 10 patients that we'd operated on all with great blood, uh, good, great blood glucose levels and serum creatinines. We set up a research um, uh, team, a trans some transplant research team, and to a large extent, it was a bit like Peter's model back in Oxford. Um, there was the transplant fellow, and Howard will recognise his picture, and I think that's from 1990. Um, and uh, Wayne Hawthorne, uh, who started off as an animal house technician but ended up being a professor of transplantation uh, 
uh, surgery at Westmead Hospital. And uh, he's one of the world's leading experts in xenotransplantation using islets. I can't remember who this lady says, hi folks, remember me. Now, kidney transplant surgery, I think is easy, um, but there's a big difference between the donor sources. And Peter Morris was really very keen on the use of deceased donors. And when there was a living donor um, on a Monday morning in Oxford, he was a bit uh, more uh, tense than usual. Uh, and that he always came in on Sunday night to see the recipient and the donor to make sure everything was right. Um, it was the advantage of elective surgery, known recipient, known anatomy, optimum donor condition, and always the senior surgeon. And compare that to the deceased donor situation where it's emergency waiting list recipient, unknown donor kidney. The kidney could be good, bad or ugly in this condition and it was dependent on an on-call surgeon. And it's no different anywhere else in the world to this day. Now, the living donor procedure is one that um, uh, Professor Modi will be talking about later in this program and, and Howard Lau might mention as well. And, and I um, watched my donor nephrectomy colleagues and Howard for many, many years doing these procedures. And it's not an easy operation. I, I suspect they don't sleep all that well the night before nor the night after because they're doing an operation on someone who uh, will not benefit from the operation at all. Now I've put up an example here of the sorts of issues that exist and uh, here's an, a kidney with three arteries that uh, the two uh, upper and lower pole arteries are easy to handle, but what do you do about the main renal artery? Uh, and there continues to be a lot of discussion on how best to treat that donor renal artery um, you can imagine if that uh, hemolock or metal clip should come off, it would be a disaster. And most of the mortality uh, uh, and morbidity associated with the live donor procedure done laparoscopically relates to this artery. Also, living donation, um, Peter uh, always considered it a, a procedure of uh, necessity. Um, it was an abrogation um, uh, of the responsibility for, in many areas of the world to develop a deceased donor program, uh, particularly if hearts, lungs and livers were required. No, no benefit to the live donor, real risk of living donor death, 0.3% uh, risk of kidney failure after 15 years in the best of circumstances, coercion by family members and others, commercial opportunities and transplant tourism and Peter had transplanted um, a number of patients from Oman. Um, and I could see that uh, he was sometimes concerned about the donors uh, and where they came from. And there was always wide discussion. And eventually we would say, yes, it was inappropriate to, uh, to undertake an altruistic uh, live donor procedure. Now, we all have experienced or come across patients who have bought their kidneys. And this was one of my patients a few years back, whose first post-operative um, um, assessment after transplant surgery uh, was in Sydney with the procedure having been performed six weeks earlier in China. And you can see the size of the diamond on her ring. So she, her family had no problems in paying for her 120,000 uh, Australian dollars, which is about 80 or 90 US, uh, thousand US dollars. Um, uh, for her procedure. She'd be a patient I'd known for many years because she was a dialysis patient and she'd not been offered a kidney transplant in eight years. So for her, from her respect, perspective rather, life was not going in the right direction unless she had a live donor kidney transplant. Now in Australia, we had a pretty poor deceased organ donor rate and you can't really get on top of paid organ donation or reduced living donation unless you have an effective deceased donor program. And hopefully Sunil Shroff will talk about this later in the program tonight. The green line represents the, the live donors in Australia 217, and it went down again in 2018 and 2019. And our deceased donor kidney numbers continue to increase and show no sign of uh, decreasing. If you look at the sources of the, of the, the um, living donors, in Australia, um, 
Uh, this is 2009 when we put a lot of resources into promoting deceased organ donation and uh, a few resources into paired kidney exchange. And we put a lot of resources into that and they now uh, make up about 20% of our live donors. And these are people who uh, are usually having the procedure because they are highly sensitized. And our living donor numbers continue to decrease, which is a good sign. Now I've got last two slides here about um, what I think the biggest contributions that I think Peter's made um, to kidney transplantation around the world. Um, his research record is extraordinary with many more than 800 uh, papers and at least 16 books that he's written or written chapters in. Um, this is kidney graft loss in the first six months uh, after transplantation in Australia. And I've compared two eras and I've not updated it because it really hasn't changed in terms of causes of graft loss. Um, the green here represents 1970 to 74. This is when Peter Morris first came back to Australia before he put a lot of, uh, before he and many others um, uh, developed a greater understanding of the histocompatibility. Um, and before uh, immunosuppression became uh, much more sophisticated uh, with use of cyclosporin and uh, tacrolimus. So rejection rates dropped, graft loss as a result of reject rejection in the first six months dropped dramatically over that period of time. The technical losses as a result of surgery has improved a little bit. But as you can see in this era, 2005, not in today, the major cause of graft loss it's in the first six months after transplantation is surgical. And I think we can put this down to development of a multidisciplinary team, a research team, all these things that Peter um, taught me in Oxford and has taught other people around the world. The other is that when you get presented with a deceased donor kidney, you might know what's inside that plastic bag when you open it up, but you're pretty confident, you can be pretty confident in this era that there will not be a hyperacute rejection um, uh, will take place on the operating table. Finally, um, some personal notes about Peter. I, I think he's just the most fabulous man. Um, and if you went to Oxford and you worked in Oxford, you felt like you were part of the, his big Oxford family. He has a, a very strong family life of his own, but, um, but everybody has been there, seems to know Peter well, and he knows you. It's amazing how many people he knows their names of and can even tell you what their children are up to. Quite an extraordinary man. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Peter Morris himself uh, and most, a lot of the information I've got has come from his Medal R Prize acceptance speech, which was published in Transplantation in 2006 and acknowledgements and discussions that I've had in the last week or so with Jeremy Chapman, Catherine Wood and a lot of help from Dr. Google with the pictures. Thanks very much, Kim.